percolate down to the surface, and that of course then created the formation of, come back to that, corals. And those coral beds will grow over millions of years. Of course, they, the conditions were perfect, warm, tropical seas, very, very rich in material. And so you have then these incredible beds of rock developing, literally made from the remains of coral. I'm going to just go back a bit. Our particular position then on the Earth's surface, here in some then, where we find ourselves in the 21st century, those beds of coral rock are now what we call Devonian limestone. And they relate to these ridges from all those millions of years ago. So it's not just in Tall Bay, but the one, the main one we have here is from Berry Head out towards the Dart, then up on the Torquay Promontory, but then also at Plymouth, at Buckfast Lee, at Chudley, where there would have been these shallow areas where coral developed. Of course, then with immense amounts of weight then being laid on top of them over the millennia, it is then compacted to form a solid rock that we today call Devonian limestone. And there it is, this one little sample of it. So, this is really like this is the, the foundation of so much of the area around here from the Stavonian period. The corals concentrated, actually then made incredibly dense, so that now we see them as a solid, very varied from massive limestone, to very fragmented limestone. But the one thing they all have in common is the fact that they are made of calcium carbonate. And these, this chemical, this um, physical structure is something that amazingly the Romans, of course, were the first people to appreciate that it had a purpose and could be utilised. So the rocks that we see here, and here you've got Berry Head, and you can see here massive limestones with an, very much an influx of iron into the, the rock, the native rock. So the Romans first then it would disappear, the skill of making the lime seemed to disappear, certainly from the point of view of Europe, and it would begin to come back into use during Tudor times, as far as this country is concerned. And the method to actually create it would be through the building of kilns, and what you see here is a typical Victorian within an area very close to Brixton, where this magic has then been brought to play. Now the uses, the reason why it became such an incredibly valuable rural industry would be because of the incredible variety of purposes which you could put in mind. First of all, quicklime, what we call quicklime. In quicklime, it would be, and it must have happened by chance, really, if you think of it originally, the fact that on certain soils, soils that, again, people wouldn't have really quite understood why, but soils that were acidic, that if you 
then added a line dressing to it, they would become more fertile. And certainly during Tudor times, this was realised. And funnily enough, when I, an ancestor of mine by the name of Tristram Risson was doing a survey of Devon in the late 1500s, he noted down the number of minefields that had been created and how lime was used to sweeten the soil. So, a fertilizer. Then, probably again, purely by chance, perhaps a farmer's wife or a scullery maid had found that this rather difficult material, which had to be treated with great care, or else you ended up literally burning yourself. That if you applied it to a surface, say a stone or wood, which would have been major surfaces used in farmhouses, etc., back in those days, that it cleaned them very, very efficiently. And it seemed to be something that was very worthwhile doing. But in addition to that, it would be a cleanser very much in a much more rural industrial way. And of course, you just take one particular area, and that was the production of leather, tanners, where you were taking hold of hundreds of skins that had been taken from the cattle or from sheep of course containing a great deal of meat on it. But by dipping them literally into a mix of quicklime, you could cleanse those skins as part of the preparation for making leather. And so in a place like Devon, where leather making was so important, it must have been an incredibly important advance when it arrived. So all of those but of course, as we, as I've noted already, the fact that in this state, quicklime is incredibly dangerous. If you got it on your skin, it would burn. And of course, in those days, probably they wouldn't have known quite what to do with that. There must have been some awful injuries that must have taken place. So treated with great care. But then, Again, probably by accident, it was realised that if you very carefully poured water onto the quicklime, very carefully, a chemical reaction took place and a huge amount of steam was let off. But it meant that your quicklime had been neutralised and it suddenly became a material that you could handle with much greater ease. But of course that wasn't the end. You've now got another material originating from mine that now can be put to other uses. Lime water. Mix it with some more water and you've got a wall to build, you've got a house that you want to create and here you've got your cement of these earlier years, these earlier centuries. And of course, lime water is still used today. Then, lime putty, that was found to be incredibly beneficial if you had work to do where your working area was nearly always constantly wet. That that would be an amazing material for helping to act as a bind. And then thirdly, lime wash. And before the days of wonderful colour cards, where you choose one out of 2,000 different colours <laughs> to paint your cottage or whatever it might be, you could now wash your cottage with a lime wash and have a sort of a yellowy white finish. 
Around here, you also have additional choices. You could go to Brixham and you could get hold of some ochre, red ochre, from the pits up there, mix it in, and hey presto, you can have a pink cottage. In other parts of the world, you will find ochres of other kind of colours, from yellows to blues. And so again, you're beginning to add a greater range. But all of this is coming simply from a piece of rock called limestone. So how is it made? How are you going to convert the limestone into lime? Well, these wonderful structures we call lime kilns, here a cross section. When we're normally looking at one, all we're seeing these days is that part, the front arch, and the structure here immediately at the front of the actual structure. The remainder it tends to be hidden from sight. And to get up above it so you can then look down at it very often is impossible these days. But not always. Now the relevant aspects to look at are that from the front arch, the bottom, we have a grate or throat, which was the access through to the loading box this great big chamber which you access basically for loading from above. So you bring your cart full of limestone from above to carefully tip it into the loading hopper. But it wasn't just to be any old limestone in any shape. They would break the limestone down into pieces roughly the size of your fist. And you are now going to build up alternating layers. Here within the firing chamber. So now another viewing of the chamber. And within this, can you see then, you've got your layer. So the base, you're going to put in, first of all, This is for the average size line cone. And that fuel is going to be initially charcoal when they were first using this concept. So you're growing your oak, which you're then coppicing to create charcoal. Of course, many of the woodlands around here were associated with the production of charcoal, as well as producing timber for shipbuilding or whatever else it might be. Then on top of that layer of charcoal, you then have your limestone, then another layer of charcoal, then more limestone, until you literally fill the chamber up. That's how it would have been from medieval times up to certainly the earlier part of the 19th century. We then begin to see coal being used, especially around the West Country. Coal measures basically a form of peat, vegetation that has not fully rotted down, but has been compacted. And it hasn't turned, we have the time to turn into Coal. And coal would be brought from sources all around the West Country, usually by boat, largely from the Bristol Channel area, which would include South Wales as an origin or North Devon. So, roughly for an average sized kiln, we're going to use four tons of stone, one and a half tons of fuel. They'll then need one day to load the chamber. 
But they're going to burn for 24 hours. And this would be under the professional expertise of a lime burner. Now, lime burners came in two different forms, really. You had those that lived and worked, say, on an estate. Excuse me. Where there would be enough lime kills to keep one man occupied, able to utilize his skills in managing their other vapors. Where you then uh, had a scattering of lime kilns, you would have itinerant lime burners who would go round from one landowner to another, one farmer to another, to do the burn. Fascinating the, some of the stories you hear though, of course, of both the advantages and the disadvantage of lime burning, especially in the winter, because of course in the winter, when they are burning, this makes a very, very nice radiator. So for those labourers, perhaps who did not have a place to rest their head where they were warm and dry, they very often would come and sleep around the rim to keep warm. That was fine until one day you didn't wake up. Because of course, coming off the burn were vast quantities of carbon monoxide. And if you were lying on the wrong side with the draft wafting that carbon monoxide over you, of course, that was your end. And I wonder when they began to realize it was something you just did not do. <laughs> You've then about 24 hours for now the quick line to cool and the chamber. Because your rock, your limestone, your solid rock has now literally become a power. This very, very dangerous. Not, not so easy to see that with the coming. This now is to the unloading of your chamber, and of course you do it by digging it out through the grate, allowing gravity to literally drop it down, and all your fuel has burnt. All you've got in there, therefore, is the quicklime. Now, out of your normal four tons of stone, you're going to get two tons of lime. And you will remove it using wooden objects, such as wooden shovels, and sacking. And what sort of gloves they wore in those days, I just do not know. Something really I should try and find a little bit more, I have to admit. But this they would have to now do. Now to give you an idea, just this is just one example for you, the costings of a kiln in 1754. The building of a kiln cost them £32.7, the stone delivered, £93.5, which is a heck of a lot of money, you think, in those days. A heck of a lot. The Welsh column as your burner, your fuel, £22.10. The shipping of the column, two boatloads, that would cost you £62.5. The lime burner's wage is £23.5. And then this I love, the seven gallons of brandy. <laughs> so, well, that was to make sure you were totally inebriated and didn't, didn't know what you were doing, keep you warm on a cold day. It's a heck of a lot of brandy, isn't it? Total £235.7. And on the sales side, that dear old measure, 
that I can remember us still having to work in when we were at school. The bushels, 3,475 bushels at four pounds ten per hundred, 147 pounds ten. Supply to the farmer around about 3,000 bushels. And this, of course, is mainly for sweetening the soil. Supplied by the farmer, two gallons of cider per day when working. <laughs> well, the kilns that we still see all the way around the countryside are immense in number. And they come in different designs, although they tend to be certain standardizations. Three forms on the whole. The conical, and we're talking basically about the shape and especially the top. The conical, the semicircular, and the lintel. You normally can classify any finds into one of those three. This is a Brixham off the new road and this used to be, as you see, a garage. It became a garage with the lime kiln within it. And the way that those structures have been adapted for all sorts of different purposes mm -hmm. since is quite fascinating. Very often, as far as South Devon is concerned, you will find many, many lime kilns associated with water, whether it's on the coast or up an estuary. Because, of course, water meant much easier transportation. This is St Mary's Bay at Brixham, and within it we've got the Dirl Head Lime Kiln there with a very interesting brick lintel type top. So, again, these variations on a theme that you find, depending on who the designer of a particular kiln had been. And then in Brixham, right down by the water's edge, just to the left of this relatively new block of flats, this used to be a paint factory back in Victorian times, and just tucked in behind it there, totally associated with this great big quarry, Devonian limestone quarry. So there is your raw material for building, especially building bricks and breakwater. Right behind, we have the remains, half buried these days, of the freshwater quarry kilns. But these were industrial. These were there to produce not just for one little local scene or little business, but to actually create a line to then sell out from here, either by land or by sea. And as we come out of Brixham Harbour, we come to Churston Cove. Again, this is all Devonian limestone from here, right the way across to the Dart. And we're going to go up to the woodland in a minute, but also we can come round the coastline into Torbay, in towards Elbury Cove. And if we do that first, we come to the Seven Sisters quarries. And all of this land belonged to Lord Cheston, and it was a major form of investment for the various generations of the Cheston family. And ships would be able to tie up along here to load the stone directly into the vessels to then take it, whether it was to be round and up to Tomnes, or whether it was to take it down, probably not to Plymouth, because Plymouth had its own limestone. But of course, many, many markets for it. Quite a bit of it would be literally, though, not up over the top, because that would have been too difficult, mm -hmm. but probably by water taking it round and into the grove, the woodland 
on the top of the back cliff walls. And this is where in the grove we have the remains of two very beautiful kilns. And the nice thing about these is that you can access them. You can actually go up onto the top of the chamber and to think of them as the cart being offloading its material layer by layer. So there, the firing chamber, and below, the grate. And what always fascinates me is that nearly all your lime kilns were made with limestone. So when you think of it, then every time you're firing that, surely the actual face within must have reacted. So then they must have had a lifespan, wasn't they? Before they would have had to have been restructured in some way or other. Now something else then that comes into the picture that I find so fascinating is the amount of thought that went into planning where they were going to build lime kilns. And I don't know, I'm sure you all can give um, examples, but when, for instance, we see the building of a new motorway, we often see then a plant being erected beside the building of the motorway to make cement or tarmac or whatever it might be. So you're not having to bring it miles and miles every time. Well, they did exactly the same thing when they were building the railways. And here, on the building of what was originally, but it wasn't the South Devon Railway, because this is the extension of the South Devon Railway, which became known as the Dartmouth and Torbay Steam Railway Company, which was an extension from Torquay down to here, literally to the station just outside where we are now. And Brunel would design the building of three very beautiful viaducts. He would never live to see them completed, which is very sad, I think. But they are beautiful structures, made of, of Devonian limestone, but in their building, they now need, needed lime mortar. So what do they do? They create a lime kiln just down the pathway, past the uh, viaduct here. In fact, it's today on the southwest coast path, just set back from it. And of course, you see, from that lime kiln, they can create a quick lime. From the quick lime, they can slate it and they've got their slate line then on site for the building. Broad Sands Viaduct, and there is the little lime kiln. You have to go and look for that in the winter because during the summer it simply is hidden by vegetation. And now to our own local, one of our own local kilns within the Gamerton area. That is what it used to look like. And I live within 200 yards of it. Dennis, who is one of our number here this evening, he lives a little bit further, in fact, nearer the, the viaduct. Uh, nine kilo. But we're both members of our Canton and Sherston history group. And when it was formed, we had then John Milne, who was one of our number, and with his enthusiasm, it was decided that we should literally expose our lime kiln and bring it to the attention of the community. And this is how it would then look. 
and all the work had been carried out on it. There, the, to the finale, there's Dennis hiding himself there behind. Maybe 20 years younger, Dennis, that <laughs> <laughs> right. And that was 2004 that that work had been carried out. And Nikki from South Devon AONB would be incredibly supportive of what we were doing. Our little interpretation board that was up there, and that has now been replaced with a double the size one, more information, a copy of which is here on the stage. And it's been a wonderful um, relationship that. Um, Nikki has provided us with. It really has it helped to enthuse us in what we're doing and keep us going. There we are, that's the latest one, using modern materials. And I'm pleased to say, Nikki, it still looks as good as the day we put it there. Yeah. <laughs> so then we go out, we radiate out from there, and just a few examples for you of what you could still find. This was a Clement Valley, very, very closely associated with Painton Zoo, for instance. White Hill Farm, Painton. Ramsley Camp, where people come to enjoy a holiday. And then coming back to Downton, here I want to show you how we get this wonderful interrelationship of geology, structure and the development of rural life and industry. This is the creek at Downton. So this is the River Dar, and this is just a creek going down in that direction towards Greenway. And Dartmouth is over the hill down there. Totnes is up to the right. Now here, the creek acts as a dividing line, a geological dividing line. This hillside is Devonian limestone, Alcala. That hillside is igneous rock. Um, now, my mind is going to let me down. Now I know exactly what it is like that. I can't get things to my mind. <coughs> Well, it's an intrusive thing, in, in rock, but never mind. The importance is that that hillside is acidic, the soil. This is alkaline. And so what do we do? Back in Victorian times, this time on the Greenway estate, owned back in those days by the Harvey family, they built a lime kiln here, right near the water's edge. And then they will ship stone from the quarries on this side, limestone, across to the kiln. From this little port, there's the limestone you see in the hillside. So they load the barge or whatever and bring it across, and the lime kilns at the base of where that tree is there. And there, the lime kiln, where they will now convert the limestone into a quick lime and they're up the hill and they can sweeten the soil of Lower Greenway Farm. Just what an efficient method of <coughs> utilising what nature can provide. Now we come from Brixham. This is Sharkham Head here, where I take the photograph, and we're looking down the coast towards Kingswear and the mouth of the Dart. And here is Mansdowns, and just by the beach here is another lime kiln. Because here we need to sweeten the soil as well, certain areas. Even though a lot of this rock here is Dartmouth slates, 
but there's also quite a bit of acidic rock as well. And of course, the easy way to transport that rock from Wrexham is to bring it around here by boat and land it on Mount Sands Beach. And having landed it on Mount Sands Beach, we can then convert it into quicklime here in the line term. Topness. So we come up the river all the way up to this major conurbation over hundreds of years, our inland port, 10 miles inland from the mouth. So the ease of transporting bulk stone is relatively straightforward, using the tide, using the river, and at this spot here, they will offload the stone at what is called Little Totnes, the port of Totnes, and here we've got industrial sized kilns where they can now convert the stone into quicklime. And cheap by charm, that in this area you then have the tanneries where, of course, all the slaughtered animals have been brought in, the skins, etc. So again, you're utilising the ease of transportation by water in this type of environment. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so the tanning industry here then, associated with the industries of topness, and also to then ship it out in different forms. Now a later find that I would then have, because of course you can imagine, once you start looking for minefields, you're always spotting them when you're driving along, going from A to B. And this one, or this pair, very different. This is at East Hogwell, near Newton Abbott. And here the minefields are required to provide quicklime for the nearby leather factory making shoes and boots and harnesses that was in Newton Abbott, needing large quantities of quicklime. And of course you have your resource, you have outcrops of Devonian limestone very close to this spot. Chubby, chubby rocks. So we're coming even further away, we're only to the team really now, you see. But here, the wonderful Chudley rocks, again, Devonian limestone, these outcrops that come out. It's as though nature was providing these lovely outcrops of limestone for the rural industries of the past. And then this is coming up the dart, from Totnes, tidal art, and this is a very old map because it shows the old, the first weir that was built across the dart as you come up from the sea, and therefore that weir is now separating out the dart, the dart moor, fresh water coming down, and the sea water, the tide water coming up as far as here. There was no leak from here at that time. The lead was coming in from further up, because as we come up past the weir, this is where we turn the stream up into the Dartington Estate. Today, water meadow, in those days, tidal. And sensibly, below the weir, where ships could come up, or small boats, there we have a line film that's situated. And this is by Little Hansen. <clears throat> come down the dance now a little way from Totnes, and we come up the very beautiful Bow Creek. And on the right here is Tucker Bay. And I think probably in all of my researches since 2000, this 
is the greatest density that I have come across of lion films. Because, of course, this place was immensely um, industrialised, Takahe, certainly during the 19th century. So as you drive along the lane coming up from the Waterman's um, Road alongside the creek, first on the right we have these two, which have been uh, improved a bit by the local history group, by Boat Creek here. They've been around and noticeable for quite a long time. But on the other side of the road, there's the road going towards Tuckham Bay from Bowbridge. There's the creek at Bow Water. And here, Turley Cottage, which actually was two cottages in one, but ironically they weren't in a typical um, linear of one cottage beside another. They were literally one cottage above the other. And the lower cottage was where the lime burn used to live. And this is the top of the lime kiln chamber, that area there. And I was taken on a visit here, which was one of those wonderful visits where you go in and you come out again, your eyes have been opened to something you never ever realized was there. I've known this area all my life. Here is the lime kiln. There is the top of the chamber, or was. Now we're going to go round the building to the other side. There. And this dear lady, this is Sheila. And Sheila was 90 last year. That is her kitchen. And that kitchen is the old chamber of the, of the lime kiln, <laughs> literally. So it is curved, the whole of the room. And she's the most delightful lady. Now from there, we're now going to go and go across the other side of the creek to the right. No, we're not, sorry. I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> I've come back up to Bow Bridge and turned up the hill a little bit as though I'm coming up um, towards Blackhawk. And this is the remnants of another lime kiln here. The lime burner's cottage there next door to it. And then we're going to go up into the garden and where the car park is today for this house. This is Yetson Lane above Bow Bridge. And there is the top of the chamber. The road is on the other side of that wall. And I think this one was the one that really made me realise how useful old line films would be these days. If you like, it's typical of the 21st century South Hands. It really is. There, a little holiday cottage. And the lime kiln is just beside it, that building there. You see it's built into the hillside. The actual chambers are in there, with the chamber tops opening up above. So we're going to go in through the front, through what would have been the arch. And this is Hill Key, and there we have it. There, one arch. There, the other arch. Now the front has been covered and it's now a children's playground for the family. Typical South Ham's holiday home. Mm -hmm. We can now wind the clock back though when we come on up here then to Sharpen House. And at the base of Sharpen House we have got the remnants of a lime kiln. Quite difficult to actually pick it out these days because it was changed from use. It was used as a gun position during the war. And of course, Sharpen Key, 
the mind film very important because your promontory of Sharpen is acidic, it's volcanic. Therefore, you needed a lot of quicklime to help sweeten the soil. Now down the dart, and this one still is one of my favourites because ironically it's one of the first that I appreciated. Lower Kilngate, which is just above Dartmouth, above Old Mill Creek. And it's a small little hard farm holding, but within it, the lovely little remains of a lime kiln. And legend has it, and there's quite a bit of proof that it could be true, that back in 1620, the Pilgrim Fathers, when they came into Dartmouth in Mayflower and Speedwell, of course they were not welcomed, these Puritans. They were the illegitimate face of Christianity at that time. They were not allowed to pray in the town. But they had here a farmer who was very much a, a, um, a great believer in the Puritan cause. And it is said that they came and prayed here at his farmstead. So up in the aeroplane, we come right out to the mouth. <coughs> so we're now looking down into the approaches of the dart. Old Mill Cove on the right, and within Old Mill Cove, we have this rather fascinating structure, which was Victorian, this uh, pseudo-castellation basically, and it's built on the site of a previous minefield. So when you go down and have a look through, and I don't think you can anymore, I think I was lucky to have <coughs> access to this before, it was actually then improved in inverted commas even more so that the interior, which in fact showed the lime film, now is now a building that is used by the landowner of the adjacent property. You see, I took that one a long time ago. I was actually doing some work on that today, and I was reading that it, so it was a lime film, then it was converted from the lime film into a mill, and then it was um, converted, then someone bought it and made that sort of front castellation on it. Um, yeah. All sorts of things have happened, haven't they? Been in the mouth of that way, right? Yeah. Right, so now up into the air, we're not quite in the picture, we're just a bit further down to the right here. But this, of course, is Kingswear, and this is Watershead Creek, and within it, we have a number of lime kilns. We have two lime kilns down here. At what's called Who Down, which I have numbered B3 and 4, and then at the head of the creek, B5. And these have changed over the years since they ceased to be lime kilns. This photograph that was taken in 1985 shows them as being two very individualistic kilns. So, Fascinates me that they were built in different shapes. You see one there and the other one with different one being a lintel and one being well not really anything really, you know, that I've quoted before. But you see, can you notice you've got the lintel holes where once there would have been a timber framework that came out over which they could throw um, a canvas sheet to keep the rain out while they were working at the front. Because of course the last thing you would want is water getting onto any quick line. So that's towards the head of the creek. And then this in fact is a 
photograph that I would take much later, in 2007, where now both kilns have been converted into storerooms by dooring them both. And then at the head of the creek, B5, this is how it looked in 1985. Then, when I took the photograph in 2007, it was largely overgrown. But since then, the Kingsway History Society, they have done a major refurbishment exercise and it is very much more brought to the attention of the local community and they are now helping to look after it. And I'm pleased to say that the Kingsway History Society has been reborn because it did actually fold which is lovely to know. And just across the river, coming down towards the castle, Dartmouth Castle, this lovely watercolour, uh, adjacent to Wharfgate, the site of a lime kiln here. And here, they're either loading lime, quick lime, into the vessel. And we come out to sea, and one of my favourite pictures, because I was privileged to know the artist by the name of John Chancellor, who was one of our best maritime artists uh, in Devon. He lived in Brixham, and it makes me really shudder to think. I knew him 50 years ago, and he died far, far too young when he was creating some brilliant uh, sea scenes of all types of vessel to the most incredible accuracy. This is a lovely vessel that we still have with us today, Shamrock, and you can find Shamrock down at Cotillo on the Tamar. But why I put this in, this is a typical example of the workhorses of Victorian England. They were the the Arctic trucks of the time, using the coast and the estuaries of the southwest to get their cargoes up and down. You think of it, we're nearly getting 20 miles into the southwest peninsula, 10 on this side and also 10 on the North Devon coast as well. So quite extraordinary, of course, the way that they would use their skills to move these cargoes and that would have been coming up this river here and up to places where I live at Gampton which was a major port in, the, in those days and you see this I think highlights this extraordinary way that the community worked with nature in making the most efficient ways of both making materials that were required and moving them. And it is a fascinating study, I think, that will never, ever cease. Thank you very much indeed.